Osio di già da Natalie Ale di già da Lovey. Sisters and brothers and brothers and sisters. I want to welcome you here today on this Sunday after Christmas. Being the last Sunday of 2014. And uh, so as we prepare to enter into the quiet time, which is uh, coming starting here in a few days, month of January is a time of reflection and introspection about our choices, our life choices, our motives. Um, basically looking at, you know, uh, did we did we do right by God, by ourselves, and by community to the best of our abilities? Or did we compromise on that for whatever our motives might be, which generally is personal gain? So, as we look at that, we also look at, you know, what the uh, what the Christmas holiday is about. You know, last last time we talked about the origins of Christmas and and of God making something good come from the uh, the harm that it was initially based on and of how God can make something good and come from that if we are willing to support that process. And why would we want to support that process? Why would we be concerned about that? Well, the answer is pretty clear in that each and every one of us has an innate desire to be at peace with God, to be, uh, to know that we are supported of by God as we journey through this life. And so we have a sense within us of a hope for adoption by God into God's family. And so for our readings today, we're going to look into some of this. So for our reading today, we're going to start with Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 40, which talks about Jesus' beginnings. So Luke chapter 2, chapter two 22 through 40. When the time came for the purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to God, as it is written in the law of God. Every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to God, and they offer to sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of God, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had had before he had seen God's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, God, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all the peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, 
having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of God, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now our second reading today, which is also from the New Testament, is Galatians 4, 4 through 7. It's Galatians 4, 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent God's Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the Spirit of God's Son into our hearts, say, crying, Abba, Abba. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. Hear the words of the New Testament. Without God's adoption, we, each and every one of us, is homeless. We have no clear direction. We have no, no sense of purpose. We are guided by impulse by genetic memory, by the need to survive. So what does it mean when, this, uh, when the readings here, we're talking about two different texts here. We're talking about Luke, who was all about, you know, proving that, that uh, Jesus was the Messiah and using the, the, the legalistic approach here in, uh, you know, the, using the teachings of the Hebrew Bible and, and various affirmations, which, you know, we take on faith actually occurred. And uh, to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. And likewise, in Galatians we see Paul, who was addressing this letter to the Galatians to start with, because there was this struggle going on with the uh, Messianic Christian community, the Jewish Christian community, and the Gentile Christian community, there, this was a, there was an internal conflict going on within the community there in Galatia, uh, where, once again, the question of whether or not Gentiles were required to conform to the law of Moses, and many of them were doing that, or if they were acceptable in the eyes of God as they were within their own cultural context. And Paul is saying, hey, God is taking on everybody as you are. You don't have to change the rules of race. You don't have to comply with the law of Moses, basically is what Paul's saying, because Christ has already taken care of that. Christ has already fulfilled the law of Moses. We're good. So, you know, Paul is dealing with that issue, so, you know, <laughs> right from the get-go, there's struggle going on. Isn't that very human of us? And uh, so we have this connection between Luke and Galatians, the validation of the origins of Jesus as the Messiah, and Paul talking about the new order of things, in the context of, of Jesus being the Messiah to the people. And uh, basically what's going on here is the, 
you know, that, that age-old struggle of power and control, you know. There's uh, people who are wanting to maintain the status quo, even in the new order, wanting to maintain their identity, their belief in uh, being the chosen people of God, so that anybody who is brought in from the outside has to look like them, act like them, be like them. And uh, this, this seems to be inherent among human beings to go down that road. And the Gentiles in Galatia were thinking, well, maybe we need to move on. Maybe we need to let go of this because this isn't really working out for us in the way that we thought it was going to. And so, and Paul's trying to keep the church together by letting the people realize that, hey, uh, God has adopted all believers into God's family. God has given a home to each and every one of those who has asked for it, has guaranteed, has made that promise, that commitment, has given a sense of purpose to each and every one who believes in God's message, in God's mission and intention. And so, in that context, we think about how is this applicable to us today? Well, let's think about that. What does it mean to be adopted? Um, I remember two little girls in New Mexico, Mary and Teresa, they were sisters, came from an alcoholic family, parents were drug, us drug users and alcoholics, and, uh, and the children had been taken away from the parents because the parents were more concerned about themselves than they were about taking care of the kids. And so, uh, these little girls were, I think, if I remember right at the time, one of them I think was seven, the other one was four, and they were deeply bonded with each other, having been through all this trauma, all the struggle, dealing with their parents. The older one, I believe, was Teresa, and she was having to take care of her little sister, basically being a surrogate mother at the age of seven. And they had gone from foster home to foster home because foster homes, many of them are good, but also too many of them are not very good places, not very healthy places. In fact, you know, we're, we're struggling with the loss here in, here in Oklahoma of a little, a little child who died in foster care. And it uh, happens all too often. And so uh, these little girls were wanting to be adopted together, but you know, uh, Teresa had uh, developed kind of an attitude. She didn't trust adults. She didn't trust authority figures. She had been betrayed. And she didn't want to be split up from her sister. Neither one of them did. They refused. And while many families are willing to adopt one child, not very many are willing to adopt two. And that made things even harder for them. But they had this desperate need, this hope, this, this want to feel like they were loved, valued, and wanted. They wanted a home. Just like all of us. We want to know that we're loved, valued, and wanted. We want a home. A home that we know is there for us even beyond this life. And they wanted a home in this life. So you can understand, you can relate to that, that deep need and that desperation within them to feel that they were good enough. That somebody cared about them. And fortunately, somebody did. And they did find a home. And it lasted. It was hard, first few years, building a rapport, building those relationships. 
but they're doing good. They're thriving, they're growing, they got their dream, and they trust in God. They believe that God helped them to come out of that, to have a home for the rest of eternity. So being adopted in this context, you know, Paul's talking about, hey, when, when you believe and you accept God's grace, uh, you're adopted into the family. Well, from the get-go, that kind of makes it a little different the context, especially in the Indian religious context. You know, we think about, well, why do we have to be adopted into God's family if God created all of us in the first place? Well, you know, willfulness is what separates us from God. Pride, willfulness, uh, arrogance, stubbornness separates us from God as we as we move forward. And, and many of us grow up in families where God is not valued. And because of that, we never actually learn the importance of valuing God. And so, uh, as we struggle with that, uh, plus, you know, betrayal of the adults who we thought were going to do right by us. And in fact, they were more concerned about doing right by themselves and using us to help that. Uh, betrayal by authority figures, you know, Washington. People don't trust politicians and yet they continue to support them. Uh, confusing. But, um, you know, uh, business, with, you, you go down shopping, you know you're going to get, you're going to get ripped off. You know somebody's going to cheat you. Home builders, contractors, whatever, you know, restaurants, get crappy food, you go to McDonald's and you order a, a, a chicken wrap and you wind up with a cheeseburger, you know, you just never know what's going to happen. But with God, so what does it mean to be adopted into God's family? God provides us with the opportunity to know that we are loved, valued, and wanted, but there comes a little bit more to it than that. And so I did a little research find out from the legal side of the point of view, what does it mean to actually be adopted? Well, here it is. Being adopted into God's family uh, has a little bit more to it than just, hey, we're children of God now. Wow, that's cool. No, there's a little bit more to it. This is from the Free Dictionary by Farley. It's the online legal dictionary about adoption. And there are a couple of things in here that I want to point out. There's a couple of sentences in here that really kind of stand out, you know. It says, uh, uh, in the context of adoption, the adopted child is given the rights, privileges, and duties of a child and heir by the adopted family. Hmm. Now Paul says we're children. When God adopts us, we're adopted as children. So, does that apply to us? Well, kind of looks like it. Another part about it is, if you're an adult, you say, hey, I'm a grown-up. God's adopted me. I'm not a kid. Okay, here's part two. In most cases, the purpose of adult adoption is to facilitate a device for inheritance. One may designate an heir by adopting an adult. Generally, the adoptee would not otherwise be entitled to inherit but for the adoption. Well, 2,000 years ago, that's what Paul said. You look at verse uh, 7 in Galatians 4, so you're no longer a slave but a child, and if a child, then also an heir through God. So by God adopting us, then you become an heir. Well, what does it mean to be an heir in God's family? Well, it says right up here in the beginning, talks about the duties of a child and heir. We have the privileges, the rights, and the duties. So what are our duties as an adopted member of God's family? Our duties are pretty basic, pretty simple, easy to follow. Christ simplified it, narrowed it down, got rid of the laws of Moses, narrowed it down to two rules. Love God, love everybody else. Love is very vague, multi-translation kind of perspective word. I tend to think of it more in the context of uh, 
doing right by God and doing right by everybody else. That means as a child of God, if you want to secure a your place in God's family and to feel that you belong, you have a responsibility, an obligation to do right by God and everybody else. And what does that mean? Simply put, thinking about what Christ did, just all of what he put himself through to help human beings out, to help human beings become joint heirs in God's family, his brothers and sisters. We have to take care of each other. We have to take care of everybody. Because we don't know who's chosen by God. Only God does. And as children of God, we are obligated to put the needs of others as equal to our own. To plan ahead and prepare for doing service work as Mother Teresa and many other examples have been set for us to follow. Reverend Martin Luther King fighting the social justice fights. Getting involved at a local level, a national level, and a world level in making sure that we are doing our part to help improve the quality of life of all people. Even if it means booting out politicians in Congress and getting politicians in Congress who are more concerned about the quality of life of everyone and not just a few. We have that obligation and that is where believers have fallen down in North America. Honoring that commitment. So we have that obligation. If you want to be a privileged child of God, you have the duties and responsibilities that come with it. And sometimes it gets to be a challenge because we look at Mother Earth. Now we look at our Mother Earth, who is the great adopter. We love him on it. Great adopter. Everybody living on planet Earth is adopted by her. She allows, supplies food to the, the good, the bad, the indifferent. And that gets annoying and frustrating at times. God never said it was going to be easy. God said, hey, you got to do your part. And so we think about if, if God and Jisa and Elohimona are all willing to support every human being on this planet, we have our responsibility to do our part. And that's what it means to be adopted by God. So, in that sense, through God's promise, we are given assurance that we are a child of God's family. We have a place at the table. And as part of that inheritance, part of that being a joint heir with Jesus, we also have to remember that we have not only received the rights and privileges, but we have also received the responsibilities from God to do right by God and to do right by every other human being to the best of our abilities. And in so doing, we make them feel welcome at the table as well. That's why Jesus did what he did. That's why we do what we do. That's why you must do what you must do. Welcome to you.